and uh, uh, let me invite Dr. Rahul Gupta. Uh, he is going to speak on complex high risk intervention in a patient with refractory VT. Dr. Rahul is from Apollo Hospital, Mumbai. Welcome, <coughs> Rahul. Now, what's your case? Yeah, uh, so good evening, uh, panelists, uh, moderators, and all the colleagues. Um, uh, this is a case uh, where, uh, you know, just like uh, is, was planned for a bypass surgery, and because he had a refractory VT that he was taken up for the uh, emergency angioplasty. So uh, he is a 58 year old male, hypertensive, diabetic, dyslipidemic, obese, sedentary, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, has been using his uh, bypass in night. Now he presented to me with a history of progressive dyspnea, angina, and swelling over the feet since last 15 days. And he was NYHA class 4 on the day of presentation. So he was admitted, uh, he was investigated, his uh, found uh, AKI and CKD. Uh, we traced his baseline creatinine, which was uh, earlier also a little on the higher side. And this, uh, this was a recent increase. Uh, SGOT, SGPT was elevated, NT Pro BNP was 10,709, TROPI was 29,884. And ECG showed small voltage complexes, poor RV progression. Because he was obese, maybe voltage complexes were uh, low for him. Uh, but ECO showed the regional wall motion abnormality in multiple territories with ejection fraction of 25 to 30%. And good thing was that the wall thickness was uh, preserved. So uh, his diagnosis was uh, end STEMI with CCF, poor LVF, AKI, some hepatopathy because of his uh, congestive symptoms. And uh, the plan was to, uh, you know, treat on ACS line, treat uh, decongest him, NIV and CAG at the earliest after optimization in consultation with the uh, nephrologist. So CAG was done for day three of admission with creatinine of 1.97 with uh, NIV on. And uh, these are some of the pictures. Uh, uh, this, uh, the LED is uh, severely calcific, diffuse disease uh, with distal small uh, caliber. Uh, diagonal 3, if you look at, is disease. So there are a lot of diagonals which are coming out, which are disease. Uh, LCX uh, shows osteoproximal 80 to 90% lesion, followed by a CTO. Um, uh, could be a recent occlusion also, but when we tried, uh, um, uh, hoping it was a CTO. The RCA showed a proximal lesion, which was uh, up here 70%, and uh, distally was 70 to 80%. There were multiple branches, uh, multiple PLVs. Uh, which, uh, when uh, looked closely, they had some tight lesions, uh, multiple tight lesions in them. Uh, the left main uh, uh, was, uh, you know, distally uh, plaqued. So the question was, what to do for this patient? So hard team discussion happened uh, with these kind of cases. Uh, considered very risk, high risk for both CABG and uh, PCI because uh, of the nature of uh, disease which we are seeing, and with other comorbidities. And finally, uh, planned for CABG after a little more stabilization, everything was discussed with the patient and the uh, patient's family. And uh, two days after CAG, when actually patient was about to, he was getting stable, was planned to uh, be shifted to the wards. Uh, uh, and uh, he developed a ventricular fibrillation at 3 a.m. He was revived with CPR. Magnesium, potassium, all electrolytes were checked and corrected. But developed very frequent episodes of torsets converting to uh, ventricular fibrillation and needing uh, defibrillation. So this uh, became a very frequent phenomena. And uh, IABP was inserted Im immediately. All antiarrhythmic drugs were given, but continued to have uh, torsets. Now the surgeons were called in to take him for the emergency CABG, but uh, they refused. These are some ECG which could be caught that these torsets were coming frequently, and some of them were getting converted into uh, the uh, ventricular fibrillation. So now the question is, what should be the approach? Uh, because now this patient is uh, critically uh, ill, getting recurrent VT. Surgeons are refusing, obviously, because uh, uh, you know they were considered very. So the only way we thought was, uh, you know, if he can revascularize and maybe uh, relieve his ischemia. So uh, all these questions came in mind to electively intubate and ventilate, or uh, do it SOS. Uh, which is the culprit vessel look like a critical LED or whether it is the circumflex which is acutely occluded uh, maybe is it is it a thrombotic thing uh, to do a complete revesc at one go or do a stage PCI which vessel to do first so these were the questions uh, in my mind because uh, obviously uh, everything had to be planned whether we can uh, should we do an intracoronary imaging or not which debulking strategy should be the approach which guides guide wire balloons so all these things uh, were, uh, you know, the thought uh, started uh, going on in my mind. CVTS surgeon and OT kept by standby, ECMO kept standby, HD kept ready in the hemodialysis, kept ready in the ICU because obviously this is going to be 
uh, more dire requiring in case I go for the complete revascularization. So everything was pre-planned as this patient may not give time. So uh, what I thought is uh, that, you know, RC is a dominant artery. It's a big uh, sized artery. So let me fix this first because, uh, you know, so that I will have a support while uh, doing the left, uh, the more uh, complex uh, uh, LED intervention and the circumflex intervention so that uh, I get enough and the, uh, the patient is uh, revascular. Uh, the uh, distal uh, circumflex was dilated. You will see the proximal stent being dilated because there was every time I was trying to pass the balloon, there was an option in that area. And uh, the, the, uh, the stent also uh, was refusing to go. So this was... Uh, dilated the proximal area which looked 50 to 70 percent was also dilated uh, the stent 2.528 was uh, implanted in the distal rca and uh, it was uh, then post dilated uh, with the 2.75 in the proximal area and then um, the 3.548 uh, stent was implanted in the uh, proximal rca so this is how the rca was completed with post dilatation and I also individually went into some of these uh, branches which were looking tight maybe they are not seen very clearly but I just dilated them to uh, quickly dilate them so at uh, low pressure to just uh, you know give as much uh, uh, revascularization as possible to uh, these patient you can uh, these were all you can see in this I think sorry this image uh, where we can uh, see a uh, tight lesions in these uh, branches of the PLVs and they're quite a significant branch. So I thought, let me revascularize. So did that. This is how I secured the RCA. It was uneventful, uh, went off well, so that, you know, while intervention, I'll have um, a more uh, relaxed approach. You can see the IABP, which was done at the time when the patient was having, even before this PCI was planned, uh, uh, before uh, um, earlier before, because we are deciding about CAVG versus PCI. So the LCX was crossed, but uh, you know, despite uh, repeated uh, dilatation, the vessel did not open up, and it looked that we have already RC, and probably this is uh, not a very contributing uh, vessel. So uh, decided to go directly now to the uh, the LED, and uh, it was quite calcific. We can see the calcium even on the uh, fluoro images. Uh, that was all calcific diffuse disease. Uh, did a small dilatation. Uh, in the uh, uh, the with 1.5 balloon at uh, low pressures and uh, after that uh, this was uh, crossed under the micro catheter with a uh, exchange with a uh, floppy uh, rota floppy wire and then with the 1.25 bar uh, the uh, the burring was done so uh, uh, now i don't have those images but every time we would dilate the uh, LAD or do a rota, the patient would go into the VFAV required, CPR required uh, shock during uh, those uh, time. So, uh, you know, these are just those images of uh, ablating. It was taking time. It was not easy that, uh, you know, immediately it ablated. Uh, but uh, these, uh, these, these are the polishing runs and all uh, which I did. After that, uh, then uh, uh, you can see some of the images that how intermittently the patient was going to the torso just on the spreading of the floor on the right image and then uh, this patient uh, the, the subsequent uh, serial dilatation from the um, the distal to the uh, proximal LED up to the left main all these uh, dilatation done with uh, different uh, sizes balloon based on the diameter because the passing of the balloon and uh, everything was quite uh, tough uh, the uh, imaging was uh, therefore deferred uh, that uh, you know we are going to judge based on everything based guidance and maybe uh, it will be difficult and the flow may not be there if we uh, pass on the, uh, the the imaging camera these are some of the images uh, at very high pressure they all dilated they gave up the lesions were opening uh, on high pressure dilatation you can see the distal dissections uh, in this uh, you know after high pressure dilatation and then uh, the uh, the uh, the wire was uh, the, this is the first stand which was uh, two into a 30 millimeter stent it also went with little difficulty it was uh, inflated uh, at a very less than nominal pressure and then after pulling it back uh, inflated at slightly at uh, the nominal pressure and suppose that uh, a 2.7538 uh, stent was placed uh, it was uh, dilated and finally uh, three into uh, 40 stent from uh, that stand till the uh, the left main was put, which I all dilated and 
so this these were the final pictures and uh, on subsequent follow up luckily for him and for us got stabilized over a period of next few days ibp was removed after uh, 48 hours creatinine rose he needed few sessions of hemodialysis uh 3 month later but his lvf uh, improved dramatically no pedal edema function class 2 creatinine reduced to 1.6 uh the bill was huge but was uh, worth it the way the patient improved and uh, now it is uh, this was done the case was done about 2 years back this patient keeps following and uh, he is still uh, fine so uh, the i think uh, this is a case where you are sometimes forced to do these kind of cases but i think these are the cases where a lot of discussion and planning uh, needs because uh, you know you might have to you have to have the plan a b c so that uh, you know whatever problems you are encountering you have already decided what you are going to do and uh, all possible interventional gadget should be available on the shelf uh, family counseling is extremely important and when we are doing these kind of uh, uh, the cases we usually tend to take a video consult because you know despite uh, spending so much the outcomes may not be good luckily for uh, the uh, this patient it was good and uh, all these things i think needs to be explained when we are doing these kind of cases thank you very much uh, if there are any comments and questions well uh, ex excellent i mean excellent uh, save um for 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 the for this patient i don't i don't think the patient had any options even with the bypass surgery the distal vessel was not a great a uh, vessel for a for a, for a bypass i don't think the patient would have had a good result even in the with the lad i think uh, well uh, i i meant the nothing nothing uh, it, i mean nothing more that i can add but i think um, it's 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 a, it's a decision that uh, you know some, sometimes you're worried about uh, proceeding with an angioplasty because of the uh, financial issues plus um the fact that uh, you're going to end up with a not so great result at the end of it because the vessel caliber and the vessel type is such but uh, somewhere you need to put, you need to bite the bullet and uh, do it because uh, surgery also is not a great option as far as uh, these patients are concerned though the surgeons will never admit to it but uh, they don't do well with such bad distal vessels any 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 comments uh, ronnie no i think i entirely agree with you this patient had no other choice but what exactly was done and these are some of these uh, so called chip cases that we do and uh, uh, this patient did well you know uh, it's excellent that you did the case with a good planning and uh, that's what angio like this require good planning the procedure uh, needs to be done systematically and as you did i think uh, i would uh, the rotablation of the lady also did help uh, my only question is do you usually always go with a 1.25 bur and then uh, go on to a larger bur or you took a small bur here because your 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 uh, lady was diffusely diseased i think the sir the vessel size was looking so small even the 2 mm balloon the smallest uh, sorry the 2 mm stent which i uh, dilated was put at a, a sub optimal uh, you know the uh, not the sub nominal uh, values and then uh, because we were risk of dissection and also 1.25 just based on the size of uh, otherwise uh, no 1.5 is what is usually preferred in my practice uh you know um, rahul um leds i mean if you go by go statistically leds are never so small left means are never so small leds are never so small you what you see on an angiogram is because of the plaque distribution throughout the vessel so the vessel looks small to you but uh, logistically speaking if you were to do an ivs or something in these patients you will find that these leds are at least 3 mm in, uh, in 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 diameter and uh, i think this we also learned the hard hard way because we used to end up deploying smaller stents in the uh, proximal and ostial lad 2.5 mm stent plus the artery looks small and they invariably ended up with stent thrombosis or uh, uh, or or high stenosis so then imaging came in it helped to show that these vessels are actually big in size what you see is is a two dimensional image based on the uh, on the in on the inner lumen so uh, i think a 1.5 mm bur to begin with would be a good idea though it may take a much longer time to cut but it it it's it's it will be good for the uh, for 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 the lady agreed so i have a question actually i just uh, the choice of the vessel on doing first uh, what i felt dr raul was probably would you do the lad first as compared this thing because some of the rca is the only vessel which has a very good flow as compared to the other vessels and if something no. went wrong in the right yeah no so th this is always a way of, uh, in that so the thought in my mind at that time was that uh, you know the rca looks very easy to do and uh, i'm not, i was not expecting any kind of complication while doing the rca 
so i will be able to finish it and i will have a support when i am doing the led uh, intervention which appeared very very complex so that was the only reason uh, but i agree to your view point you can so that was a thought in my mind so but this is what i do i think if anybody uh, you know have a different uh, view point as to the approach uh, dr amit i would actually uh, uh, not think the way that you thought you know when you're doing a complex case like this and uh, when you know that your lifeline is the led when you go for the led and you're going to do a rota i mean when you plan this i would definitely prefer to have some support to my led and i think i would also go exactly what dr rao would i would plan and go into the right coronary so that it would give me a lifeline when i touch the led because the rca theoretically speaking will be an easy job you are not likely to land up in a complication while your likelihood of having a problem in the led is much higher a lifeline is absolutely mandated when you do a case like this yes yeah i i i fully agree you need to keep keep one vessel open you have some support so that in case this close up also you can I mean you can still rely on the right to give you some support because the circumflex is already occluded you're not you're not going to open that so i i fully agree with that keep keep keep, keep one vessel open yes this is the easiest one to open it then go for the other because sometimes you may have slow flow in this no flow in this and then you have a critical uh, stenosis in the in the in the other vessel then with hypertension that starts closing off so it becomes a mess so maintain maintain one artery open and then go for the and it's, it's absolutely right what what uh, and i probably we would have done the same thing with uh, what what rahul did though he was much more gutsy here in, uh, in 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 taking up this case with with, with all the uh, yes. issues issue, issues at hand with vt vf i mean it it it, it does require a lot of team work a lot of um, uh, support from your colleagues your anesthetist your staff your technicians yeah. When you when you do, and plus you need to maintain your cool when you're doing it. Excellent. Thank you. Good. I think we will uh, go to the last speaker of this uh, session, and that's Dr. Ashwin Tumkur. He will be speaking to us on bailout LMC stenting during primary PCI. Dr. Ashwin is from Yashoda Hospital, uh, Hyderabad. Thank you, Dr. Roni, Dr. Ajit, and good evening, one and all. Uh, let me yeah as dr ashwin putting up in the slides dr rahul if you can hear me uh, uh, just a curiosity did his vt settle down the moment you uh, put the uh, stent and you revascularized the lady yeah that's what i felt because his vts were they became very frequent at the table when he was uh, when we whenever we were pulsing or rota ablating and he settled very well so that's what we did not expect that he would do so well uh, but he has done well and there was no option as we were discussing in this case so we went at but i think the led was the culprit which was troubling him a lot 